In this video, we're going to use a simulation-based approach to analyze the relationship between body temperature and heart rate. So we have here a fairly small sample, and we've recorded temperatures in degrees Fahrenheit and heart rates in beats per minute. Um, and then you can see the regression equation that we use to connect those two with the slope and the intercept. So those values that we've calculated, even though they sort of feel like final after we get them out of jump, um, those are statistics. Those aren't parameters. Remember, a statistic is just a summary value that's calculated from the sample. So the slope and intercept that we have here are statistics. And just like any other statistics, they're going to vary from sample to sample. Right? If we took another sample of people, we wouldn't expect to get exactly the same slope and intercept as we got in this sample. So if we want to ask, does a linear relationship really exist, or is it plausible that this sample slope just occurred by chance, then we would need to do a hypothesis test about the parameter. So the symbol that we're going to use to represent the parameter is beta 1. So B1 is the sample slope, beta 1 is the population slope. And the null hypothesis is that there's no relationship between these two things, so that would just be a slope of zero, right? Because you can imagine if you plugged in anything for x and the slope was equal to zero, your predicted values wouldn't change, right? So a slope of zero means no association. So if we wanted to write this in words, we could say no linear association between these variables. So between, I'm going to abbreviate temp and heart rate. And that's talking about in the population. Right? We don't need a hypothesis test to tell us what's going on in the sample, um, but this is a test for um, whether the relationship actually exists in the population. So keep in mind that this slope being equal to zero, um, even if this is true, even if in the population the slope is equal to zero, um, the sample slope, or B1, the sample slope um, won't be exactly zero. So the question we're left with is, is our sample slope large enough to convince us that this wasn't just due to chance, that it's an actual relationship in the population? And then the alternative hypothesis, usually you see these as two-sided tests, although technically it could be either one. Um, so if it was a two-sided test, we do beta 1 not equal to zero, um, and that's just that there is a linear association. And I'm going to be lazy and not write the whole thing out but there is a linear association between temperature and heart rate in the population. So before we jump into the 3S strategy, let's remind ourselves how we've done it in different data contexts. So let's say we were looking at a treatment and a control group and trying to see whether people improved or didn't. We used different colors to represent improvers and non-improvers, and then we shuffled all of those cards together, dealt them back out into treatment and control, calculated the proportion of improvers in each group, and then we needed one number to summarize everything that was going on. So we calculated the difference in the proportions, that was one option at least, and plotted that on the graph. What about when we had a quantitative response? So here we had to write down numbers to represent, in this case, the improvement scores. We shuffled all of those numbers up, we dealt them back out into two groups. This is quantitative data, so we're calculating the mean in each group. And we need a single number that summarizes what's going on, so we take the difference of means. So let's take a second here and think about how we could modify these simulation strategies to test the significance of a correlation or regression. So I would say think about your explanatory and response variables, whether they're categorical or quantitative, and which parts of the simulation do you think still work, and which parts do we need to modify. And I'll tell you in particular, one thing you need to modify is the statistic that you're going to use. Um, and I would challenge you to try to think of a couple different ones that you could use to summarize the sample. So how are you going to summarize the sample? What statistic will you use? How will you do the simulation? Pause the video and take a second to think about that. So there's several different um, statistics that we could use to summarize. The most obvious one is probably just using the sample slope, B1, um, since that's how we wrote our hypotheses. Um, but you could also use the sample correlation. So the correlation is represented by a lowercase r. 
Um, or you could use R squared. That would be an option, right? That's a way of summarizing how strong the association is in the sample. Um, or you could even do a t-statistic, right? We could do a t-statistic where we do the statistic minus the null hypothesis value divided by the standard error. We just have to use a simulation or something like that to figure out what the standard error should be. So what about the simulation? So we're going to try to use cards. We're going to try to match it up to what we've done before. And we still have a quantitative response, heart rate, and that's something that we've seen before. So when we had that in the sleep deprivation example, we started by writing all the response values on cards. So we'll say write the values of heart rate on cards. So with this, we're representing our response variable. And then we're going to shuffle everything up. So that's the same as before. In the past, we've dealt them into two or three groups. Um, so maybe something like treatment and control or a couple of different treatments. But here, that's not going to work anymore, right? Because we're not comparing groups. Instead, we have a quantitative explanatory variable. So basically, what we're going to do is we're just going to randomly match them up with the existing x values. So we're going to deal out the cards matching them up with the values of temp. So we still have the same values of heart rate and temperature, but instead of having them go together, we're going to just randomly match them up. Step four, we're going to calculate our summary statistic. So I'll just say calculate the slope or other summary statistic, whichever one you're using here, and repeat. There's an applet to do this, but first I have to show you the um, animation because it's so beautiful. Um, so we've got the heart rates written on cards, and we're going to shuffle those up and then match them again to um, the different body temperatures. So for that random shuffle, the correlation here came out to be, looks like between 0 and 0.1. We're using correlation this time to summarize. We do it again. We're going to get different values of the correlation. And that's just so satisfying, isn't it? So we've got all the different correlations. They're going to end up being centered around zero because we're assuming that there's no relationship. And out of this set, only one was as extreme as our sample correlation, which was 0.378. Um, so we would estimate a p-value of 0 0.03 from this. Um, but really, we want to use um, the applet to get more simulations. So I've got the data here. I'm going to take it and copy it. And we're going to be using a new applet for this. We're going to be using the correlation and regression applet. So I'm going to clear out the sample data that's there and paste in my data and click Use Data. OK, so there's that scatter plot of temperature and heart rate that we see. We can add the regression line here. Now let's think about the simulation. I'm going to be using the slope for my summary statistic here. And if I do one shuffle, so basically what this is doing, if we look at the data, we have the same x and y values that we had before, but they're randomly matched up, right? So maybe there'll be a positive trend, maybe there won't, but the null hypothesis is that there's no association between them because they can't be associated if we're just randomly matching them up with each other, right? So we can look at the plot here. The red line is what we got in our original sample. The blue line here is what happened just by chance. So we can see that slope is pretty close to zero, the blue line, which is what we would expect, right? If they're just randomly matched up, we would expect the slope to come out pretty close to zero. Let's do it again. That one, also very close to zero. Do it again. So we're seeing the little gray lines are the values that we had gotten before. So we're sort of getting an idea here of the range of slopes that could occur just by random chance. And right now it's looking like our sample slope is pretty unusual. I'm not really seeing any simulated ones um, that go out that far yet, but I've only done 20 shuffles. Um, so let's do more of these. I'm actually only going to go up to 1,000 because sometimes it gets a little bit slow in the applet. All right, so there's our distribution of shuffled slopes. Um, we can see that it's centered at zero because our null hypothesis is that there's no association between the variables. That's what we're modeling here. And we're asking if the null hypothesis is true, how likely would it be to get our sample slope, 
So this will find it in the distribution. Um, this would actually be, if we're testing for an association, could be positive or negative, then that would be a two-sided test. So we're going to pick beyond here. And we can see mm, just barely below 0 0.01, 0 0.097 for our p-value. So this picture is showing us the values of the slope, the values of B1 that we would get if there were really no association between the variables. And we can find our sample slope, maybe here, something like that. So our sample slope was 4.72. And then we're also going to go the same distance out on the other side and shade everything that is there or more extreme. And that's how we get our p-value of 0 0.0970. And if we're using the guidelines in the book, I guess technically this would be considered moderate. Um, so this would be only moderately strong evidence of an association. So only moderately strong evidence of an association between these variables. So between temperature and heart rate. So strength of evidence here, this really involves two different things. Um, it involves how strong the association is, so that's like the correlation or the R squared, but also how big your sample size is. So in this case, the association wasn't all that strong, the sample size was only 20, and so we just end up with moderately strong evidence of an association. Another option for the statistic would be to calculate the T statistic. And if we do that, we can see that the scale has changed. It's on a familiar scale now, just a little further than negative 3 to 3. And we can also overlay the T distribution on this. So this distribution is showing us the values of the T statistic that we would get if there were no association. And the benefit of a T statistic is that you can use a theory-based distribution to model it without having to go through the simulation step. So the distribution that we're using here is a t-distribution, as you would expect, and the degrees of freedom for this are n minus 2. So if we click over here to show the regression table, um, we can get 1.73, that's our t-statistic for temperature, and we can put 1.73 into the distribution. And notice we have both the simulation-based version and the theory-based version. So the theory-based version comes from finding that t-statistic and shading everything that's more extreme under the curve. So the p-value does come out very similar, 0 0.1007. That's very similar to what we got from the simulation. So we found our t-statistic, t is 1.73. We just let technology calculate this for us, which I think is the easier way because the standard error formula is very messy for this. But we're finding our values, and then we're shading the areas under the curve to get the p-value. And that was 0 0.1007. And this is sort of a good example of why we don't want to be overly reliant on hard cutoffs. Uh, because the p-value turned out just barely different here, um, but it is across the line of 0.1. Um, still, we don't really want that to change how we feel about our evidence, right? The strength of evidence here, virtually the same, um, whichever of these p-values we get. So that's the logic behind a theory-based test. Um, in later videos, you'll look at more details of that and also see how to check the validity conditions.